I am Nathan. I'm going to talk about a primal do extension of the Gumans and Williamson algorithm to the fractional cut covering problem. Uh, this is joint work with Marcel Di Carli Silva and Cristiani Sato, as well as Leventum Chow. Okay, and let's get this started. Uh, before we go, I just need to you know like define some basic things because uh, I implicitly use them. So like you know, if I don't define them as the first thing that happens in the talk, I'll, I'll probably get everybody confused. And uh, well. Most of you are already familiar with the Laplacian, right? And I just want to make one small remark about it, right? So we can consider the Laplacian of a graph G as a linear transformation, okay? So if uh, it is a linear transformation taking vector index on the edges into symmetric matrices, and uh, you define it by the way the Laplacian with weights W is just the summation over every edge of Wij times this lovely quadratic form. Right. This is what most of you know as the Woodrow Laplacian. And the only remark that I'm making here, the important point, is that if you think of the Laplacian as a function on the weights, that's a linear transformation. Okay. Just nothing, nothing on my sleeves. And uh, what is really nice from the fact that it is a linear transformation is that it has an adjoint transformation. Okay. So there is this transformation from the space of symmetric matrices on V. Uh, can people see my mouse, my cursor? Can I assume that? Uh, um, can you move your person so I can chat? I'm moving it around right now. No, no, I can't. Oh, okay, okay, I was not expecting that, but uh, yes, let's see how that goes. Uh, okay, so the adjoint Laplacian is a function which takes out the symmetric matrices on the vertices and spits back a vector on the edges, right? And if you pick Z, big Z, capital Z, to be such a matrix when you apply the joint Laplacian and you look at its ij entry. This is exactly zii plus zjj minus 2zij, zij, okay? And uh, this is just defining that vector for every entry. And uh, while the usual Laplacian matrix that people uh, work with and care about is just the, the Laplacian uh, linear transformation applied to the vector of all ones, okay? And if you look at the expression that I have here, zii, minus, ZII plus zjj minus two zij, and you think, wow, that really looks like the square of a difference. You're right. And uh, this is another thing that I'm gonna use a lot. So uh, if you pick any y to be a positive semi-definite matrix, okay, so that first line is in there is introducing the notation for PSD matrix uh, indexed by the vertices, right? Whenever you have that, you can look at this matrix as the matrix encoding the inner products of a set of vectors. Okay, so I have little v, I have one of vi, one, one of each. So v, i is a vertex of my graph, right? So vi uh, is going to be one vector for each vertex. And I record all the inner products and I write it down and put it in a matrix yij, right? And what is great about that is that our intuition that we had before about the square of the difference becomes an actual, you know, math, precise mathematical statement. Uh, in other words, if you just look at the Laplacian adjoint of a matrix Y when Y is PSD, this map this only gives you on the entry IJ the square of the distance between VI and VJ, right? So that is really really nice because this is telling you that Laplacian adjoint encodes the information of the distance between the vertices. Okay, and well. The summary of this part, this first introduction, is that whenever you you have a PSD matrix and you have the the IG entry is at most gamma, you should just think, hey, that means that the inner product of y, vi, and vj is at most gamma. And whenever you have a lower bound, as we had there, like the Laplacian adjoint of y is at least that, this is just asking you that the distance squared between two vertices is at least that ij. Okay, and good. Let's talk about our problem now. Uh, well, a cut, we are looking at a set of edges whose removal disconnect the graph, okay? Another way, which is more convenient of defining it, we are fixing a subset of vertices, right? And we are looking at all the edges which have precise, which have one endpoint in my chosen set and one endpoint in the other set. So here in the drawing, we are using the yellow to highlight the set that we choose and to look at the edges on the cut that it defines. And we are interested here in cut covers, okay? 
And uh, to explain it to you, I'm going to present to you a cut cover of the complete graph on eight vertices, right? So here I just have uh, three copies of the K8, and I'm going to convince you that this is actually a cut cover. Uh, what is going on here, and uh, it's a shame that I cannot, ah, okay, annotating did not work. Can everybody see my screen? I cannot see it. Nope. Oh, no. Uh, let me see how I... Hmm. Uh, wait, I'm going to stop sharing and sharing again mm -hmm. and see if it helps. Uh, can everybody see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so, let's look at this. We are looking at a cut cover of the complete graph on eight vertices, right? So, what I did here, the way to look at this drawing, uh, you, if you look at the rightmost vertex, so the rightmost vertex, uh, this is the vertex which I labeled, labeled zero. And then you can go in counterclockwise direction, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And, uh, and when you do that labeling, you have the following cuts that, I, that I'm going to look at. The cut defined by zero, two, four, six, two, three, six, seven, and four, five, six, seven. OK, and how do I see that this is a cut cover? Well, one way is to just like look at the thing and like think about like you look at each edge and you see if it appears like it's going to appear in precisely one. But it's a little bit boring and I get, you know, I don't have the attention span necessary to do that. There is another way of looking at how this works. Uh, some of you may have seen that coming from a mile away, but we can look at the binary representation of our numbers. OK, here we have all the numbers from zero to seven. All of them can be represented using three bits. And uh, if you look at the first cut, so the one on the left, uh, I'm separating all the vertices whose last bit is zero from all the vertices whose last bit is one. OK? So uh, yeah, that's why all the even ones are in my cut and all the odd ones are outside of it. If you look at the one in the middle, I'm separating all the cuts, all the vertices, which have uh, the second bit one from the ones which have the second bit zero. And if you look at the one on the right, you have all the, I'm separating all the vertices whose uh, most significant bit is one from those whose most significant bit is zero, okay? And that gives you a proof because if, pick, if you pick any edge, this edge gonna have two endpoints and they're gonna be distinct numbers. And since they are distinct numbers, they have to defer in some bit. And therefore they, that, but, that bit must be covered by one of these cuts, okay? And uh, this actually, it is actually the case that this is the best possible cut for the complete graph on eight vertices. And uh, this argument that I've showed you, like the, the cleanest way of proving that, you actually prove that the best cut cover that you can get on any graph G is the ceiling of the log of the chromatic number of G. Okay, so this is a promise that like this idea that I've been talking about uh, on bits is the best you can do. So like what this, this equality is telling you is that the best you can do, you color your graph, and then you look at the, at the coloring that you have, and you do this bit trick that I just showed you. And uh, yeah, when you do that, like uh, it becomes easier to prove that equality holds here, right? And uh, the main thing that is going to happen is that whenever you have a cut cover, you can actually uh, find the coloring of the big enough cube that you need. And uh, well, great. So it means they like solve the problem. No talk is over. Let's all go have lunch. But uh, the thing is, uh, it's both great that we know how to compute the cut covering number. And we know we have this expression, but that's also a problem because the chromatic number is something that like in general, we do not ho know how to compute, right? So this raises the question, if there are other like similar things that we could try to approximate and reason about uh, that we could compute for any graph in polynomial time. And uh, Looking at this uh, setup here, we can already see uh, it's like the starting point from the fraction cut covering uh, formulation. Because if you look at this drawing, 
okay? So if you think about the edge between the vertex zero and seven, it's going to be colored in each one of the three drawings. You can see, the, you, can see you can check that out. And this is because they differ on each one of the three bits, right? And if you look at the edge between zero and four, since they differ on a single bit, it's only going to be colored once. So it's kind of weird that, that, in, that in this setup, one edge is going to be covered three times and the other edge is just going to be covered once. And this makes you wonder if there's a way of you making it all more homogeneous, okay? And well, even more so, this particular construction also like tells you that it, it is possible, right? Because if we take a step back, we have all the vertices with, uh, we, have, uh, we have three subsets, all of them have cardinality four from uh, all the vertices, which are eight of them, okay? And we could look at all such sets. So let's think about, let's think that we pick all the cuts induced by a set of vertices, which have precisely four vertices, okay? And let's fix that a vertex zero is in that cut, okay? This is really important because uh, S and S complement induce the same cut of, on edges. And uh, so I'm just gonna fix so that I don't count it once. I don't count each one of them twice. And when you look at all this huge set of vertices, a set of cuts, uh, what is going on there? Like what happens if we think of that as a cut cover? Well, uh, we have this formula down there. So like uh, the first part, the half of eight to four that we see there, this is how many cuts we have picked. Okay, so among all the sets, the subsets of vertices with cardinality four, we pick half of them because we are double counting with respect to complementation. And uh, when you do so, you can realize that each edge in your graph is gonna be covered six to three times, right? This is the case precisely because as soon as you fix that one edge is gonna be in one endpoint and the other edge is gonna be in the other endpoint, all that you gotta do is pick between the remaining six vertices, which one go to your side of your cut. And uh, so when you do that, you're picking this huge amount of cuts, but you're covering all the edges many, many more times, right? And things are uniform in a way. So you may want to look at what is the ratio that you get there? So the amount of cuts that you have divided by how many times each edge is covered by a cut, okay? In this particular case, the number in the denominator is the same. Uh, in general, you'd pick a minimum, right? But either way, that's your definition of the fractional cut covering number, okay? You're just like counting with, you can pick cuts several times and you divide by how many times each edge appears. And actually equality is going to hold there, but I'm not gonna uh, talk too much about that. And uh, well, good. I hope that made sense, but that was not a proper definition, right? Uh, a really nice way of encoding that construction that I told you about is using linear programming. Okay, and uh, this is really similar. I'm sure some of you have already seen that of how one can interpret the fractional chromatic number, both as a linear programming problem, but also as like covering, uh, as a covering problem, right? And uh, so yes, let's formulate this in linear programming problem. So this is my definition, the fractional cut covering number of G. Uh, what I'm doing here? Well, let's first look at Y. Y, uh, so P of V is the set of subsets of V. Okay, so Y has one entry for each subset of V and it has one non-negative entry of that, right? And what I'm doing, I'm looking at this interesting summation there, the summation of YS of the incidence vector of that cut. And that summation has to be at greater than or equal to one, right? If you look at that summation, this, uh, this inequality is a vector inequality. So it means that it has one inequality for each edge, right? And when you break that down, what you're saying is that, uh, you want that for each edge in your graph, if you sum the weights of all the cuts which cross that edge, that sum has to be at least one, okay? This is what we call a fractional cut covering, a fractional cut cover. And among all such fractional cut covers, we want one which minimizes the total number of cuts that we pick, which is precisely the inner product of the vector of all ones with y, or in other words, just the summation of all the entries of y, okay? And uh, because the scaling is going to work, the intuition that we built before about like your, uh, your dividing by how many times you pick an edge, everything is going to work perfectly here. One of the main things that we're gonna do, and I'm gonna talk, about, I'm gonna talk more about that later, is that we're going to introduce one extra parameter here, 
okay? So uh, instead of asking each edge to be covered exactly once, I find that boring, I'm going to give you a vector z, which has one entry for each edge, so like zij, right? And I want each edge to be covered at least zij times, right? And this is what we call the weighted fractional cut covering problem, okay? Uh, this is a linear programming problem still with the generalization. And therefore, it means we can take its linear programming dual. And its linear programming dual, then we, we are maximizing z transpose x over every non negative vector x on the edges, right? Such that for every subset of v, if you sum all the edges induced by the cut uh, defined by s, that is at most one. But check how interesting that is. For every subset of vertices, if you look at the cuts in uh, the summation of the edges on the cut inducer, that's at most one. This is the same thing as saying that if you take, if you put the weight x on all the edges of your graph, the maximum cut is at most one. Okay. And this is really, really nice. And this is, makes me extremely happy because I really like semi definite programming. And we have a beautiful tool on some definite programming to study the maximum cut problem, right? And this is our question then. This is the one of the things that started this, this work. Can we dualize the celebrated approximation algorithm by Gumans and Williamson, okay? What is this algorithm? Well, there is this same definite programming problem, which we're gonna call the max cut SDP, okay? And uh, I'm gonna denote by MC tilde on top because it's an approximation, right? And uh, what we're doing there, we are maximizing the inner product. And this is the inner product between matrices, right? You can think like I'm just scratching my matrix as a big vector. And then I take the inner product with which one of those entries. And um, so I'm maximizing the inner product of one fourth of the, the weighted Laplacian of W times a matrix Y over every matrix Y, which is positive semi-definite and has one in all of its diagonal entries. Okay, what you can do with that, and it is beautiful, first you show that uh, for, any, uh, for any cut, you get a feasible solution to this problem. So you prove the second inequality in the line in the middle there, that the, max cut, the maximum cut of GW is less or equal to this same definite programming problem, right? But what is even more interesting is that you can pick the optimal solution to this SDP and obtain a cut back. Okay, and what is going on here uh, goes back to what we were talking about before uh, in terms of uh, grim matrices. Okay, if we look at this matrix, this PSD matrix, which one with ones in a diagonal, what we are asking, we are asking, uh, we are putting our vertex, we are assigning one vector for each vertex in our graph, and we require all of our vertices to be on the unit sphere. Okay, that's what the, the constraint on the diagonal means. And uh, so we have this geometric representation of our graph. We are holding our graph in this unit ball. And from that unit ball, we can just like select a hyperplane uniformly at random. And we're gonna cut our unit ball in, in half. And the way that we cut this unit ball into two pieces defines an edge cut, okay? And if you sample according to that edge cut, you're gonna get, obtain a good enough cut. Right, And this is great news for us because this shows that this is already a technology which generates a maximum, which generate cuts from a given matrix, right? So when you look at that, one question that you may have is like, how can you find the right PSD matrix so that when you sample a bunch of cuts, you get a fractional cut covering, okay? Uh, this is interesting because uh, if you look at what is going on here, you are fixing W and trying to solve the max cut problem. And we want to solve the fractional chromatic, the fractional cut covering problem. So there is some other problem that we need to solve, right? And we need to understand like, uh, when you solve that problem, how do you, uh, and after solving that problem, how do you actually sample to get something out of it? And well, there's already work in that direction, right? And uh, really, really nice result, which comes from uh, work by Samal and also by Neto and Benamur. Uh, already uses this uh, geometric representation situation. Uh, you can define the vector chromatic number of a graph to be, so look at, forget the objective value for a moment. So you're just looking at a PSD matrix, which has one in the diagonal. So as I was talking about, you're just representing your graph in the unit sphere. 
And for each edge, you want the entry yij to be at most gamma. So if you think that gamma is negative, this is going to force like your vectors to be far apart, right? So this intuitively is a vector version of the chromatic number because you want to put your vertices in the unit sphere and you want to force them to be further apart looking at their inner pattern, okay? And what is really interesting is that like uh, when you solve this problem, you get a lower bound uh, on the fractional cut covering number, okay? So the fractional cut covering number is at least two times one minus the reciprocal of the vector chromatic number, right? And this lower bound is not too far off from the actual value because if you multiply this lower bound by the reciprocal of the Gumans and Williamson constant, you, you get the other inequality. Okay, so those, those two things are really, really close to each other. And this is great because it gives you a polynomial time constant approximation algorithm for the value of the fraction cut recovery of G. Okay, and um, what is even more interesting is that like, if you go and if you dig into the proofs, you see that the upper bound is actually obtained by repeated sampling from the Gumas and Winston distribution, right? So like the algorithm is almost there and uh, or part of, part of our starting point on this work was to refine these ideas. And we refine it into the following theorem. Uh, so what is going on here? Well, we have the Gumas and Williamson approximation constant, and I'm going to pick any number which is less than it, like so beta. And it's not too small, you know. That's that that part is like necessary for technical reasons. Don't worry about it. But the main thing is like uh, you always want beta to be as close as possible to alpha GW because that means that you have a better approximation, right? Anyway, given any beta that you pick you have a polynomial time randomized algorithm which produces a fractional cut cover for you, okay? Well, not quite. So it produces a vector, right? Which has one entry for each subset of V. Uh, we, you know that like this, this vector could be potentially too big and that that would be, not be polynomial, but we can, we can ensure you that this vector will only be non-zero in at most logarithmic many entries, okay? So that's what the support is telling you there. And, uh, so you have this, let's say, small vector, uh, such that when you sum all the entries there, uh, you have something which is uh, not too far off from the actual value of the fractional cut covering of number of, of G with respect to Z. And finally, you have that with high probability, the solution that you get is actually a fractional cut covering. Okay, so with high probability, you got an approximately optimal solution, which all of it in polynomial time, and you don't need that many vectors, okay? that many uh, subsets, okay? So your vector is not too big. And just before we keep going, uh, one, if you look at what is going on here, one of the main contributions is that this works for general weighted settings, right? So one may ask like, why should one care about weights? And uh, just, you know, like to recover the context uh, in which Samal talked about the fractional cut covering number, uh, a function f from edges of g to edges of h is cut continuous if, for every t subset of v of h and for every s subset of v of g, the pre-image of, uh, of the cut defined by t is, a, is equal to the cut defined by s, right? This sounds like a lot of symbols for actually saying something really simple that we are saying here is that a function is cut continuous if the pre-image of every cut is a cut. And well, what is nice about that is that, well, I'm gonna take this uh, function and I'm gonna put it in a matrix, okay? It's a really simple matrix, don't worry too much about it. Uh, so this matrix has one column for every edge of G and the column corresponding to the edge, to an edge of G is the, is the edge in corresponding to, is one in the entry corresponding to an edge of H, okay? So you're just like, I'm just encoding this function in a matrix, it's like a permutation matrix, but it's not a permutation because you're going from, uh, it's a function from E of G into E of H instead of like E of G to itself, for example. But don't worry too much about that. The main thing here is that like, when you apply the transpose of that matrix to a instance vector, here the instance vector of your edge cut, uh, this is the same thing as like looking at the pre-image. So the previous inequality becomes that one, the PF transpose, uh, times the incidence vector of delta t of the edges in, by the cut inducer by t is equal to the incidence vector of the edges induced by s. What is nice about that? Well, let's pick a non-negative vector which we know that the max cut value is at most one, and let's apply this matrix to it. Okay, 
So, well, this matrix may be complicated. You may not have understood much about it, but what is important about that is that like, it is non-negative. So if you pick a non-negative vector and multiply by a non-negative matrix, this is going to be non-negative. And I also claim that the maximum cut in H now of the image of X under this, uh, under this, uh, this matrix conformation is at most one, okay? And the reason why this is true is that whenever you, you take this uh, PF of X and you take its inner product with a cut in H, this is going to correspond to some cut in G because F is cut continuous and you have the information bounding the value on the cut in G, okay? So that's really, really nice. Things like play together in a really subtle and beautiful way, I think. And uh, well, why does, okay, why am I talking all about, you know, why I'm saying so much? Well, when you look at that, you actually get an inequality between the fractional cut covering number of H and the fractional cut covering number of G, okay? And uh, yeah, this is just what we just did here. Uh, you just, the first line is just the definition. And then uh, what I'm using there is that like, if you pick any X on the second, on the set, on the line in the middle, right? So X non negative, such that a max cut is at most one. When you apply PF of X to it, you have a set on the inequality above. So you have the inequality there and therefore, I can just move things around and get a fractional cut covering, right? So what is really, really nice here and uh, what, you, what is going on here, uh, what is usually called the fractional cut covering number is when you choose that to be equal to all one vector, right? And uh, since PF transpose of an incidence vector is its pre-image, the pre-image of everything is everything, right? So this gives you a proof that uh, whenever there exists a uh, cut continuous function, the fractional cut covering number of H is at least the fractional cut covering number of G, okay? And, uh, but here I'm saying more, I'm saying that like the way that we put weights respect this, this deeper structure of, of uh, cut continuous functions, okay? So it plays really, really well with the original setting which things came up and I'm gonna talk, you know, I'm interested in that. We're gonna talk more about that later. And okay. Now let's talk about the same definite programming relaxation that we have. Okay, let's look at the fractional cut. Co co sorry, let's look at the fractional cut covering number of G with respect to C. Right, uh, using uh, linear programming duality, we saw that this is equal to this expression, which relates to the max cut. And I don't know much about the max cut. The max cut is complicated; it's hard to compute. However, we have the max cut SDP and we know that it's not too far off. So it's natural, instead of imposing an inequality on the max cut, we impose an inequality on the approximation that we can compute, right? And this is going to be my definition of the fractional cut covering SDP, okay? And uh, well, before I talk anything else, before I say anything else about this uh, SDP approximation, what is really nice is just from this definition, you can already convert the quality of the approximation of the max cut SDP into the quality of the approximation of the fractional cut covering SDP, okay? So you see the fact that like things are preserved, it's like our starting point. You just use like the, the first inequalities and you can like scale things, move things around, and then it all works just from the definition that I gave, okay? But uh, well, I'm saying that this formulation is an SDP, so, uh, how, you know, it doesn't look like an SDP. I do not know if it is an SDP. It came from the max cut SDP, but you know, well, uh, now I'm gonna use same different programming strong duality, which is, you know, eh, it's basically linear programming duality with, you know, it's like more technicalities, not much. Uh, the max cut SDP is equal to the minimum of the sum of all the entries of X, right? where X is a vector which has one entry for each vertex in your graph. And it is such that one fourth of the Weddell Laplacian with respect to W is at most the diagonal matrix with respect to X. Nathan, what does it mean for one matrix to be at most another matrix? That is a great question. It means that if you take diag of X and you subtract one fourth of the Laplacian, that is a positive semi-definite matrix, okay? And uh, well, yeah, this is just taken from the dual. You're gonna have an inequality, but since both SDPs are really well behaved, you actually have equality. And um, what is nice here is that you are formulating our SDP as a minimization problem. So this makes it really, really simple for us to obtain upper bounds on the max cut SDP. 
right? And this solves our problem because if you recall, the fraction cut covering uh, SDP is maximizing Z transpose W for every W non-negative such that the max cut SDP of that W is at most one. Well, because of the, what we just talked about, that maximum cut SDP is at most one if and only if there exists an X such that Y transpose X is at most one and one fourth of the weight of portion is less than or equal to the diagonal matrix defined by X. Okay, I'm just using the inequality above to give me a uh, upper, to give me the upper bound that I want. And well, this is another SDP, right? And I have, as I was talking to you before, we have SDP duality, so I can look at this dual SDP. And this is the really, really nice thing. When you take the dual, I will not bore you with all the technicalities here, but you have that this is minimizing mu, such that mu is a negative number, and there exists a matrix Y, which is positive semi-definite. All of the entries of the diagonal of Y are equal to mu, right? And such that one fourth of the adjoint Laplacian is at least that. And what is great about this is that we just found our graph representation that we can round off, right? If you look at what this constraint is telling you is that you can think of your matrix Y as a bunch of vectors in a hypersphere such that uh, it is the hypersphere whose radio is squared is equal to mu. Yes, I always get confused which side is squared, but that's what is going on there, right? We are just requiring that like VI transpose VI is equal to mu. So we are minimizing the hypersphere, the radius of the hypersphere in which we are putting our vertices such that, and now we can use the fact that we understand what the joint Laplacian is doing. So we are putting our vertices in this hypersphere we want the distance between any two vertices to be at least four times zij, right? And then we minimize the radius of the sphere that we want. And that's our fraction cut covering SDP. And good. So we have an SDP, we know how to compute y. And then the question is like, well, nice. How do we get an actual approximation to our problem? Well, when you solve the SDP, you're going to have some representation of your graph in the hypersphere. Right, and here I have represented, you know, like this lovely graph. Uh, you can think here what is going on. The smaller edge is an edge with weight one, and all the other ones have weight two. Okay, so you are forcing that the distance between those two smaller edges has to be half of the distance of the other edges. Okay, and uh, to try to understand how do we get a solution from by repeated sampling, let's just try to sample and see what happens. Uh, you know, we just like pick a random cut and see which edges it crosses. And then we do it again and again and again. And uh, what we are interested in here is going to be on the ratio between how many cuts go over each edge, right? So here it's represented by like, if you pick each edge and you ask yourself, like you just have to count how many of the cuts actually like physically cut that edge, right? On the drawing. And uh, well, let's look at it, looking at our SDP. Um, so we have our geometric representation here, right? Let's look at the, the drawing on the left first. Um, what is going on there, I just sampled like all the possible cuts, right? Uh, like, you know, uh, and I just draw all of them. Uh, the ones which do not cross the small edge, I've colored white. And the ones that cross the, the small edge, I've colored yellow. And what is nice about that is that when you look at that, you can realize that the probability of that edge being cut is proportional to the inner product of those two vectors, right? Think that the middle of the circle where the, the hyperplanes are coming from, this is zero. And uh, so you, you have like your vectors coming out of there. And then we're gonna look at its inner product. That's gonna be precisely the angle in yellow. And then you can see that uh, that inner product is, you know, it is what is going to define the probability of that edge being cut. And um, that is great because that is like the, that is precisely the kind of information that we are encoding, right? And uh, what is even more interesting is that like, so we have this probability distribution and what is going on here. And the main thing that I want to highlight is that as soon as you fix your geometric representation, so as soon as, as, soon as you know where your vertex is gonna lie in this hypersphere, you have a probability distribution on all the cuts, okay? Just as an example, look at the writing, the, the drawing on the right. Uh, 
Uh, I have fixed that I want the cut which separated the vertices in yellow from the cuts in white. Well, what are those cuts? Well, I do not actually know how to compute that given y. It's really complicated, you know, like we don't need to go into that, but we know that there is a probability and we can actually define that probability, right? And here I have highlighted as like the, all the hyperplanes that would lie in this yellow region, okay? And uh, all of these remarks can be made precise in a really, really nice way. And they tell you that if you define a fractional cut covering in which uh, the number of times that you pick a cut is proportional to the probability of that cut being sampled, right? You're gonna have that, uh, this is going to cover Z because it respects the ratio of the distance because one far from the Laplace in the joint would leave that. Right, and uh, its inner product is not going to be too bad, and it's not going to be too bad, meaning it's at most one fourth of the objective value that you had, and, and that, oh sorry, well, not one fourth, one over the Gumans and Williamson constant, and that comes because our approximation, uh, you know, is borrowing uh, technology from the max cut algorithm, and uh, just before I move on. Just looking at this fact and that, that you can actually round these things, this gives you another way of interpreting our SVP, okay? This, this explains to you why you're trying to minimize the radius of a sphere. Because by the last inequality, the radius is how good, how small your fractional cut covering is after you round, okay? So uh, that's what is going on here. You, you can look at this rounding procedure as another way of understanding our, what our geometric approximation problem is doing. And uh, yes, this is refining some ideas present in the paper by Nato and Benamur into this more general weighted setting, okay? And well, yeah, what is great about that is that we finally have an algorithm, right? And our algorithm, well, what it does, what we fix the approximation constant that we want. So we fix the number between one fifth of the Gumans and Williamson constant and the Gumans and Williamson constant. And then we define all of these things, but please don't waste your brain power trying to you know, decrypt what these numbers, these expressions are doing. I just want to highlight one important thing here is that as soon as we fix beta, all the other things are constant, okay? So you can see that sigma bar is constant. Epsilon bar depends on sigma bar and beta. So it's constant as well. And C just depends on beta, so it's constant as well. So all that you need, you know, as soon as you fix beta, you have these constant numbers. And these constant numbers appear in our uh, approximation algorithm, right? And what does it do? Just like a quick explanation. Uh, so the approximation, of, the approximate FCC receives a graph and the Z, the weights on the edges as an input. And the first thing that we have to do, we're gonna go over every edge over every entry of the vector z, so like one entry corresponding to each edge. And if that edge is too small, we're gonna round it up, okay? So here, what we are doing is like, if that, that e is less than or equal to half times epsilon times the largest entry of that, okay? The largest entry of that is, is that infinity in R, um, because we are assuming that is a negative. Anyway, if your, if your edge is less than half times epsilon times the largest entry of that, we just round it up. If you think about our construction, this is really, really important. And the idea is that uh, let's assume that you have an edge which have like a really, a really small ZIJ value. If ZIJ is really, really small, when you solve your problem, you're gonna, you may end up with uh, vectors which are really, really, really close together. And if they are arbitrarily close together, it means that the probability of a cut separating them is arbitrarily small. And that would imply that you would, that you would need to have arbitrarily, arbitrarily many cuts to be able to get a cut cover. Because remember, a cut cover must cover every vertex, every, sorry, every edge. And uh, so, you know, that sounds like an annoying problem, but it works that we can just round up those small edges and everything just works nice. Uh, okay, after rounding up these edges, because, you know, precisely because they're small, they're not going to affect their objective value too much. So things are, appro you know, approximations work well. And what we, what we do then, we just solve our, our SDP and we find an approximately optimal solution, right? And here you also need approximation because, you know, like uh, SDP is like uh, objective value of the SDP, a famous one is, uh, is square root of five which is the Lovastera function of C5, blah, blah, blah. But the point is like you may not, uh, a rational number, for example, which are encoding here 
may not be will never be actually equal to the objective value. So what is going on here, like we are just taking approximate solutions because we may not, when we try to put that on our computer, make our computer work, we may not be able to uh, actually solve it to equality, right? So we need to approximate there as well. And that's what Sigma bar is doing. And well, as soon as you do that, you just do what you want to do. What was your original plan? What we wanted to do from the start is that uh, just like C times log N times, we just sample a, a cut. So the line number six, it's uh, as receive a cut from the Gamos and Williamson distribution defined in the matrix Y, right? And how did we do? We just keep up like, uh, we're just counting how many times each cut appears, okay? And uh, we are keeping Z hat, which uh, we're just, if you see what is going on there, we're just adding one into each edge of that cut so that we know how many times each edge was covered by the set of cuts that we have selected. And then we use that information to scale Y and obtain uh, the solution the feasible solution to our problem, okay? So basically all that we are doing here, we are just sampling our cuts and then we scale in the end and we give back to the user, right? This is a, I find like this is a really, really interesting algorithm. The main step was precisely to understand that this geometric representation problem that we are looking at could be solved via an STP. And then we can look at these STPs, the optimal solution of this STP and uh, actually obtain uh, approximation to our problem. And well, yeah, that's the main thing that I had to show. Now I just want to discuss some other ideas with, with y'all. Some of you may be thinking like, hey, this is an algebraic graph tree seminar. No, this sounds a lot like a lot of optimization. But, uh, you know, if you already care about eigenvalues, you know, caring about some definite programming is not that hard. You know, like we just have like all these eigenvalue problems, you know, for example, here, I'm going to give an example in which you have an eigenvalue problem. You see that you can play around it, which matrix you're looking uh, when you're trying to solve this eigenvalue problem. And that gives you more information, right? And when you pick the best matrix for some eigenvalue property, you're probably doing some different programming, right? Uh, what is going on here? Forget about, this is another way of formulating the max cut SDP. Okay, so the max cut of SDP of G and W is equal to this minimum. Forget about the minimum for a while, okay? Just assume that you have a vector U and if you sum all the entries of U, that's zero. Well, using that U, you can sum that, uh, you can turn that U into a diagonal matrix, and then you can sum that to one fourth of the weighted L portion of W, okay? This matrix uh, will give you information about cuts, okay? Uh, what is going on here, you can look at the really quotient if you encode your cuts in the right way, which is just like, the right way just means that uh, you, add, you put plus one, on the entries that belongs to one side, the negative one to the ones that belongs to the other side. Anyway, looking at the possible Rayleigh quotient of this matrix, you can see that uh, this, the value of the maximum cut is less than or equal to the largest eigenvalue of this matrix divided by n, okay? So the, the problem that we care about that we are trying to approximate can be upper bounded by this eigenvalue problem. And since this is the case, we can pick the best upper bound that we have. And that's why you're minimizing that lambda max, okay? So this is just another way of formulating the fractional cut covering SDP. And you can prove this equality by taking the dual of the max cut SDP that I showed you before. And you just wiggle it, wiggle it a little bit, you know, rename certain things, like move some things around. You basically do nothing and then you get this reformulation. And, uh, but what is really, really nice is then that you have this Laplacian. Right, so the it is the weighted Laplacian. You divide by four, and then you play it around with its diagonal, and now its eigenvalues are giving information on the cuts. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with like the the case in which uh, you assume u to be zero. This is a well-known result, and uh, the reason that I'm bringing that up is that uh, when you when we you're, we are solving our problem, we get we have some z uh, on re plus. And we compute all of this information. So we compute our geometric representation, right? Which I'm encoding as Y is the PSD matrix, which has mu on the diagonal and such that one fourth of the Laplacian adjoint is at least that. But we also compute W non-negative and mu such that U transpose one is equal to zero, such that the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, this Laplacian is at most one over N. Okay, so th this again is, uh, is also like the same duo that we had before. I just wiggle it around and that's how you get this thing. 
And what is also interesting here is that you have one more inequality because if you look at those two lines, they, they have nothing to do with each other. The first line talks about Y and Z, the second line talks about U and I, U and W. But uh, when you solve your SDP and you assume that you have an optimal solution, you're gonna have by complementary slackness for SDP, which is once again, you know, basic complementary slackness for LP. Uh, you're gonna have this really nice fact that like, if you multiply these matrices, you've got the zero matrix, okay? And at first you may be looking at that and say like, so what? Well, I would like to just, you know, just move things around here. And what we have here is that one over N times Y is equal to this Laplacian that we've been talking about, this approximate Laplacian, this almost Laplacian times Y. What can we say from this? We can see that any column of Y or in general, any vector in the image of Y is an eigenvector of this Laplacian, okay? So this is really, really nice because Y is encoding both a geometric representation of G, but also the eigenvectors of Laplacian. So I wonder if there's like other ways of looking at this problem, looking at this uh, eigenvector information uh, and doing something perhaps similar to how people study Chigurh's inequalities or something like that. If there is some way in which you could leverage that kind of rounding to obtain another way of uh, looking and understanding what we are doing here. And in general, if you could then connect the type of arguments that we have when you look at Chigurh's inequality with this type of arguments that we have when you have geometric representation of graphs. I honestly do not understand everything that is going on here, but I'm interested in that. And if you are as well, please come talk to me. And just to wrap up, the last thing that I'd like to mention, uh, which is really connected to algebraic graph theory, is how like, well, when you have a cut continuous function, you have this inequality, right? So the fraction of cut covering of G applied to the PF transpose Z is at most less than or equal to the fraction of cut covering number on H on Z. We, we have similar things going on in other contexts. In particular, we have that going on for graph homomorphisms, okay? A graph homomorphism is a function between a vertex set of two graphs, such that whenever ij is an edge in g, fi fj is an edge in h, okay? And whenever you have that, you can prove uh, the same inequality that we just that we proved before using the fractional chromatic number. Okay, and if you know what this proof is, you, you realize that the proof that I showed you before is the same proof, okay? Because another way of formulating uh, the, pro the property that, uh, that a function is a graph homomorphism is to say that per image of every stable set is a stable set. So it would be a stable set continuous function, okay? But what is even more remarkable than that is there are like some other type of uh, optimization problems which arise on graphs that also be also respect this type of inequality. So as one particular example, which I find quite interesting, is that the Lovastata function of the complement of a graph also respect the same type of inequality. So there is a common thread going on there uh, relating how uh, optimization problems and these homomorphisms, you know, or this like uh, this categorical information, be actual homomorphisms or be cut continuous functions, how they play well with optimization problems. Right? And this is something that I'm interested about. Like, I wonder if we can use more optimization to understand this, homomer this type of categorical information better and vice versa. And uh, yeah, just to wrap up, uh, what, uh, one of the points I'd like to highlight is that uh, we introduced a weighted version of the fraction cut covering number, and that allowed us to use uh, convex optimization techniques uh, more easily. And uh, when we do so, we can use duality theory of complex optimization to obtain an extension of the Gumans and Williamson celebrated approximation algorithm. And we extend that to the fractional cut covering setting. And uh, this extension is really, really tight. And you have like a bunch of connections, which I'm not going to go too much into it. But for example, whenever you solve the max cut SDP, you're also solving the fraction of cut covering SDP as well. And that's unavoidable. And that's really, really interesting. And that's why we call like, you know, it's, there's some kind of primal dual relationship going on between them because by solving one, you're solving the other. And, uh, and you can actually get something like the chain of inequalities that I'm showing there in which uh, you can upper bound the maximum cut of something by a given fraction of cut covering problem, right? And that, that, that tells you that you can say that a maximum cut of a graph is less than or equal to a given number by looking at a certain uh, fractional cut covering on that number.
okay? If you want to know more, I know that it went a little bit too fast on this part. Feel free to ask me more about that later. And that's all that I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for a nice talk. Okay, so any question for Nathan? Okay, so if there's no question, then I would take this opportunity to ask a stupid question. So like, um, you see, like, every time you talk about Laplacian, like, automatically people are going to think about adjacency matrix, like you said before. So like, <laughs> uh, so if we you just look at the like line graph of the graph and I'm thinking about this cover problem. So can we use adjacency matrix? Like will this algorithm also works? Uh, so when you go into the line graph, you are now going to be covering vertices, right? That's mm -hmm. what you want to do. Yeah. And um, I don't know. Uh, I'm curious, like, the first thing that comes to mind, like I'm not, it's not clear to me precisely how uh, the cut information would translate from the graph into the line graph. Okay. Because uh, yeah, the, the the really the really the really important thing here going on is that we are tying the eigenvalues of the Laplacian to cuts. Right, right, right. And this eigenvalue bound is the one that like we are really really uh, taking advantage of. Uh, so yes, I don't know if that would work. I, uh, yeah, um, I'll f I, yeah, I didn't think about the line graph. I, I'll take a look and see if I can understand what is going on. Okay. 